Um, thank you very much again for joining us today. Um, I've heard that we've got a, a couple of hundred on the um, uh, on the stream at the moment, and more coming in as we return from the break. Uh, so we're now about to introduce some of Australia's foremost experts uh, in AI, quantum, and robotics. It's been a really interesting time um, over the past few years for Australian industry policy, um, and particularly with respect to the AI game. Um, several years ago, uh, there was, uh, you know, with the advent of Malcolm Turnbull becoming Prime Minister, the National Innovation and Science Agenda, um, which introduced a raft of policies to incentivize investment in these spaces. But um, this came at the same time as the shutting down of the automotive sector, as some of you may recall, with uh, Ford, Holden and Toyota leaving the country and shutting up shop. Um, and uh, I think that that contributed to uh, a rather heated debate with respect to AI taking people's jobs, um, uh, a debate that wasn't particularly helpful or very representative of the um, state of the industry and the state of technology. Um, you know, in, in 2021, uh, Simon Devitt uh, wrote in the AFR that the Australian Research Council, um, which was the premier funding vehicle for um, you know, fundamental and applied research, um, established the Special Research Centre for Quantum Computing Technology, and that this was a um, huge, uh, huge step forward uh, with respect to uh, the development of the next frontier uh, of what's going to take Australia forward. Um, you know, we've uh, certainly been over the 2000s and 2010s one of the premier uh, global R&D players um, in, in the quantum space. Um, and during the 2000s, we saw the proliferation of quantum research groups across the country and the establishment of many ARC centres of excellence. Um, and these were focused on developing the fundamental technological underpinnings of quantum. Um, combined with an aggressive recruitment campaign, both domestically and internationally, Australia signalled to the world that quantum was going to be a major part of technology innovation in the 21st century. Um, this was, of course, backed up by the government setting up uh, the quantum computing company in partnership with a number of large tech players a few years ago, and Michelle Simmons continues to, uh, uh, to lead the charge out of UNSW to this day. And I think it's really not, not hyperbolic at all to say that um, Australian research institutes and Australian researchers have shaped the, the global development of quantum tech to a, a remarkable degree. Um, you know, about five years ago, uh, quantum computing, communications, smart sensing technology began moving out of labs as it caught the attention of major corporations um, and the venture capital community worldwide. And um, with our comparative advan uh, advantages in Australia um, with respect to the mining industry, uh, uh, those technologies have never been more applicable. Um, the rest of the world has certainly caught up. Um, you know, only last month, 800 people attended a, a quantum conference with leading researchers and entrepreneurs and advisors. Um, so the question now is, wh where are we now? Um, what happens when uh, AI and robotics meet quantum? Um, how does it fuel imaginations and power innovation and challenge societies? Um, what does the future really hold? And what are the skills that we require critically to harness um, the potential constructively? In this session, we're going to hear briefly from each of our global experts, uh, and I'll, I'll sit down with them for a Q&A session. Um, I'll be ask, asking some questions of my own, but would like everybody, both in the room and those playing at home, to get involved. So um, if you could uh, open your devices and uh, enter slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, slido.com, into your browser of choice, um, you'll be able to access the portal at which you can submit questions in real time, which we'll be reviewing, moderating, and asking our panelists. Uh, the event code that you will need to uh, enter once you have accessed slido.com is Future Work Summit. All one word, Future Work Summit. Once you've got that sorted, uh, I will introduce Maria, who's going to uh, tell you a bit about all of our panelists. Thank you so much, Harry. I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Dr. Jeremy O'Brien. Jeremy is the co-founder and the CEO of SciQuantum, and SciQuantum is building the world's first commercially useful, large-scale, general-purpose quantum computer to solve many of the important problems that will be forever beyond the capabilities of any conventional computer. Jeremy is dedicated more than a quarter of a century to this mission, 
having, sorry, more than uh, 25 years to this mission, having identified quantum computing as the most profoundly world-changing technology with the potential to tackle some of the greatest challenges we face across climate, healthcare, life sciences, energy, and beyond. SciQuantum is working with global Fortune 500 companies to identify the most valuable quantum use cases for their business and to develop the algorithms that can be run on the world's first commercially useful quantum computer. Prior to founding uh, SciQuantum, Jeremy was a professor of physics and electrical engineering at Stanford and Bristol universities and director of the Center for Quantum Photonics. His work towards scalable quantum computing includes micro, nano, and atomic scale design, fabrication and operation of superconducting and semiconductor devices, the design, construction, and operation of cryogenic and ultra-high vacuum systems, the design, construction, and application of low noise electrical measurement to organic super and semiconductor or nano uh, structures, and the theory of quantum computing. Jeremy received his PhD from the University of New South Wales. He holds the Royal Academy of Engineering Research Chair in Emerging Technologies, and he's a fellow of the American Physical Society and the Institute of Physics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Jeremy O'Brien. Thanks very much for that, uh, that kind uh, introduction. I think I need to... Um check with my communications team that we don't get too carried away with these uh, biographies in the, in the future, but that's very, very kind and thank you very much. It's really a, a great uh, pleasure to, to be with you, at least uh, virtually today, and I'm, I'm excited to just uh, share a bit of my perspective um, on this very exciting event that uh, you have going on here. So uh, as, as you've heard, um, my name is Jeremy O'Brien. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of uh, SciQuantum. Uh, SciQuantum is, a, uh, is about a six-year-old uh, Silicon Valley company. Uh, we're about a couple of hundred scientists, engineers, and technologists. And we are doing just one thing, which is to build a fault-tolerant and therefore useful uh, optical quantum computer. <clears throat> Let me just advance these slides here. Um, no more. So I think if you've picked up a newspaper any time recently, you'll be aware that the world uh, really desperately wants uh, quantum computing. You know, billions of dollars are being spent towards this goal by corporations, uh, startups and governments around the world. And the reason for this uh, massive and concerted effort is that there are computational problems which will never be solved by any conventional computer that we humans uh, could, could ever build. And so what I mean by that is even if we took every silicon atom on the planet and built a gigantic conventional supercomputer, we still would not be able to answer these exponentially hard problems. And quantum computers have the potential to solve these profound and otherwise impossible problems. And so I'm really excited now uh, to be working with a growing list of customers and partners across pretty well every industry. And, you know, we're, we're working with, for example, five of the world's biggest pharmaceutical companies, one of the world's biggest banks, two large material companies, a huge energy company, and so on. And all of these Fortune 100 and 500 type companies understand the hugely disruptive uh, potential of quantum computing. And they're working with us to write the code, develop the algorithms and prepare for the existence of this technology. And let me first spend a, a couple of minutes here on the application space where I'm particularly excited, which is climate. Uh, quantum computing has the potential to allow us to design uh, new catalysts for carbon uh, capture and use, uh, new, new better uh, batteries, fuels, fertilizers, et cetera. And what's sort of interesting to me is that around the world, we're seeing huge corporations who have you know, been able to essentially happily ignore chemistry and physics for decades, suddenly realizing that the technology that they have built upon is no longer fit for purpose. 
And this is forcing them to search for alternative chemistries. And the fact is that conventional computers have a really hard time simulating chemistry. And those conventional computers will always have a really hard time, i.e. large instances will always be beyond the reach of any conventional computer. And the only way to perform the exact simulations of molecules, reactions, and so on, that is required for practical, deterministic, in silico design is quantum computing. And so I'm really excited that our quantum computer will be able to accelerate step change improvements in these critical technologies, which I believe will be required to sustain a good quality of life on the uh, planet with the growing population that we have. And we, I think I'm, just make sure I'm on the right slide here. I, think I went backwards instead of forwards. We started out um, building prototype quantum computers in the university. Uh, we proved out the basic idea of putting single photons into uh, silicon chips, uh, leveraging silicon photonics technology, which uh, had been developed by the telecommunications industry over the last 25 years or so. And this chip that you see in the top left was the first uh, quantum processor uh, on the cloud of any kind back in 2013. And it's now on permanent display in the British Science Museum next to a Babbage difference engine and an Enigma machine, which I'm uh, very proud of and would love to see in, in the real one day. But I think the uh, important point here is that um, all along we knew that you would need something much bigger and much more serious to tackle useful problems. So any useful quantum computer will require at least around a million qubits. And to put that in perspective, you know, Google have around 53 qubits today, others, you know, around 100 qubits, something like that. So there's a big gap between what we have today and what we need. And so we're talking about, you know, building, you know, a building scale machine with, you know, thousands of silicon chips, half of them photonic, half of them electronic, thousands of optical fibers, kind of like in a, in a regular data center. And Clearly, you can't build that sort of uh, that sort of system in a university environment. And back in 2015, we founded this company and moved uh, to Silicon Valley when we uncovered a path for uh, building such a system in an industrial uh, type environment. And a million qubits uh, might seem like a um, a uh, you know a lot, and indeed it is. Um, but it's been my conviction for, well, more than 20 years that we won't see quantum computing, at least not in my lifetime, until we can figure out how to leverage the semiconductor industry, which of course routinely puts billions of transistors into your pocket these days. And what you're looking at here is the interior of our silicon chip fab at Global Foundries in upstate New York. And over the past few years, we've uh, taken our technology really out of the university, out of the small sort of startup regime, and are now building thousands of uh, silicon wafers in this production line, right next to the uh, chips that go into your laptops and mobile phones. And I believe we're unique in any quantum computing effort to have reached that uh, level of maturity. And this incredible leverage, the you know, leveraging the 50 years and trillion dollars that went into the semiconductor industry now puts us just a handful of years away from that useful machine. And, you know, when we look at the quantum computing industry uh, as a whole, you can see some really interesting uh, recent trends going on. Of course, everyone likes to argue about uh, who's got the best qubits, um, which are the basic building blocks, like the transistors, if you like, of a quantum computer. Um, but in fact, the qubits really aren't the problem. Everyone's got pretty good qubits at this stage. You can make uh, qubits in, in, you know, out of all sorts of different uh, physical platforms, and they all work pretty well. But the real differentiation and the big remaining challenges are around scaling. So going from that of order 100 
qubit to that of order million qubit system. And those challenges, you know, aren't really very uh, quantum at all, actually. Um, and those challenges are manufacturability. So the first one I've already hinted at, like how do you come up with an economic uh, path to manufacturing these systems? And as I say, it's been my personal conviction that you have to leverage uh, the existing semiconductor industry to do that. Uh, cooling power. So all uh, approaches to quantum computing require some level of cooling. Can you get the required cooling power at the scale uh, that you need? Um, connectivity. So any useful quantum computing is, as I say, a large uh, sort of building scale system and it needs to be wired up and it needs to be wired up quantum mechanically. And that means you need quantum interconnects and the only uh, foreseeable way of doing that is photonically. So you need to wire it up uh, almost certainly using the same technology uh, as you know the optical fibers that are increasingly dominating data centers and supercomputers today. And then finally, uh, you know, I, at the risk of uh, offending our uh, electronics team who are absolutely uh, world-class, I, I like to joke to people that, you know, everything has to work in the system, even the boring bits. And I don't think the electronics are boring at all, but think if you think about it, for a moment, any type of um, quantum computer needs a whole lot of conventional control electronics in it. Some of that control electronics needs to be proximate uh, to the qubits and therefore of a compatible uh, operating condition and also a commensurate density with those qubits. And I won't uh, have time to go into the details here, but um, it's my conviction that uh, this photonic approach uniquely uh, has a path to addressing uh, not just one, but all of these uh, remaining uh, challenges to scale. And this uh, this sort of new level of maturity is, is I would say, really uh, reflected in, in the workforce. So when you think of uh, quantum computing, you might think of, you know, experimental physicists and PhDs in physics and a research lab and so on. But our workforce at Psychonum is actually mostly made up of people who've never had anything to do with quantum anything in their lives before because they've you know, been focused on manufacturing products. So semiconductor engineers, software uh, systems engineers, applications engineers, and now we're even hiring chemists and quants and so on. So very often people come to us and ask whether they need a background in quantum to work on quantum computing. And of course the answer is no. On the other hand, uh, corporations are increasingly hiring PhDs in quantum information to prepare for the existence of this technology. And we even have uh, high school students programming quantum computers on AWS and Azure. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting, uh, this part of the field is going the way of uh, deep learning. You know, PhDs in fault tolerant quantum algorithms are, uh, are becoming very uh, highly demanded indeed. And it's uh, rapidly becoming a completely new and I think really exciting career for young you know, mathematically, technically inclined people. And I think this is a pretty significant uh, indication of the maturity of, of, this, of, this, of, of the field uh, and particularly uh, our organization. So let me just conclude um, by uh, highlighting that, you know, we have, um, we've really, sort of removed the, the science and the early stage uh, components of the problem. And we're now deep into a, um, uh, a semiconductor manufacturing phase of the development. And, you know, we've, we've, we've already proved out the leverage model that, I, that you know, has been my professional uh, life's work, leveraging that semiconductor industry. And uh, pretty soon we're going to get into the regime of, you know, large scale infrastructure. So, you know, concrete and steel beams and kilometers of optical fiber and so on. So this is a really exciting uh, point for this industry, really exciting point to think about the uh, future workforce with, you know, an incredible technical breadth and depth. And I certainly couldn't, you know, after 25 years or whatever it is, I couldn't be more excited to be working in this, uh, in this field. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you. Summit is uh, detailed resumes. 
because I just don't think we uh, give enough of the Australian population a sense of what it took to get you to where you are. Uh, I didn't mention that you were joining us from the United States. So I'm very grateful to Jessica Richmond for putting us in touch. Uh, I hadn't been aware of the work that Cyquantum was doing until I started to do the research for this session and uh, you've blown us away. Uh, I, was, I wasn't aware of the progress that you had made and it's uh, incredibly um, uh, satisfying that you're an Australian in America leading uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, one of the questions that I don't doubt Harry will ask you is uh, how significant President Biden's announcement in the State of the Union that he was that Intel was investing 20 billion in infrastructure in the US to for semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, but I'll leave that to the, the Q&A later because right now I'm going to introduce you to uh, one of my favorite people, Dr. Sue Key, uh, who's a, le a global leader in robotics. She's founder and chair of Robotics Australia. And Sue is an expert in emerging technologies and has recently taken on the role as the robotics technology lead for Oz Minerals. She's, a, she's passionate about developing new technology industries in Australia and founded and chairs Robotics Australia Group uh, and the Australia AI Collective. Sue led the development of Australia's robotics map, 